so today we're looking at the middle part of Oedipus Tyrannos. Let's look at our discussion questions. One, do you think Oedipus should have stopped his inquiry? Maybe on page 30. Why or why not? Two, do you think Oedipus should have stopped his inquiry? Maybe after Jocasta advises him to. Why or why not? Three, what do you think is the purpose of the third choral song? How can you tell? Four, do you think Oedipus should have stopped his inquiry? Maybe after Jocasta leaves. Why or why not? Five, what do you think is the purpose of the fourth choral song? And how can you tell? OK, so first question on page 30. Uh, so let's look at what's going on here. Um, on the previous page. Uh, Jocasta has come in. Jocasta is, of course, Oedipus's wife and unbeknownst to him, his mother. And he's asking her about what happened to Elias. And uh, she says, so he asks her, what did he look like? What did he look like? Uh, what age was he? And she says, dark, though he'd started sprouting some white hair, his build was not dissimilar to yours, so it is somewhat similar. <clears throat> uh, his build, which means the shape of his body. And here's a note for your uh, vocabulary lists. The opposite of similar is dissimilar. So she says this, then on page 30 he says, oh no, it seems just now I failed to see that I was casting curses on myself. To cast a curse, right? What's that, my lord? She calls him my lord, first of all, because he's the king. Secondly, because in ancient Greek culture, it was a patriarchal culture where the men had power over the women. Uh, I look at you and tremble, zanto. So probably out of fear or anxiety or something. But notice she says, I look at you and tremble. So not based on what he says, but how he appears, how he looks, his attitude or even his energy. Today we would say his vibe. Oedipus, I'm terrified the prophet isn't blind. So Tiresias, remember the blind prophet, said that Oedipus himself was the source of the plague of the curse. Uh, and Oedipus, of course, didn't believe him. But now he's saying, what if he was right? Of course, the prophet is blind, but here Oedipus is talking about uh, what Tiresias can see of the future and of the past, I guess. Uh, then he continues, but you can clarify. Tell one more thing. So at this point, uh, Oedipus suddenly realizes that he might be wrong. He might be in danger. Um, and yet he keeps on asking questions. So let's see what he asks next. Uh, Joe Costa replies, I'll tell you anything, although I'm shaking. Oedipus, then did he, Laius, go alone or bring a large retinue with him? A retinue is a group of people that follows the king or leader around. Uh, as, so, right, as befits a leader. Befits just means fits, as fits a leader. Jocasta says, a group of five in all. 
a bodyguard among them. Lias traveled in one wagon. Uh, and I get the footnote says. Uh, so these five people were probably one driver, one bodyguard. Uh, two enslaved attendants. And Lias, so that's five people. When Oedipus hears this, he says, no, now all this is coming clear. So what's happening is he's starting to realize that the man that he met on the road at the crossroads where three roads meet, the one who tried to run him over and so he killed him, that man is apparently Lias. He looks like uh, what Jocasta describes Lias as. There were five people that Oedipus uh, killed. So it's more and more likely that Oedipus has fulfilled the first half of the prophecy that he will kill his own father. So now all this is coming clear. And yet he still keeps on asking questions. But wife, who gave you all this information? And Jocasta replies, a house slave. He alone came back alive. So Oedipus killed four people. Oedipus, oh, then is this man in the house right now? So it looks like he wants to get to the source of the information. He wants direct confirmation. Again, this is a situation where learning the truth would be terrible for him. Yet he keeps on digging, he keeps on asking questions. Jocasta says, no, when he, the house slave, came from there and saw that you were in control and Lias dead, he begged me holding my hand, a slave holding the hand of the queen. He begged me to send him to the fields and shepherd pastures, Mu Yang uh, Ren very far away from where the town could see him. And I sent him. As much as any slave, he did deserve to have this benefit and more besides. So these last two lines tell us that this slave was a good slave. Uh, he was loyal, he was obedient, so he deserves benefits. And yet such a good and loyal slave does not want to stick around the house anymore. Once they come back and he comes back and realize that Oedipus is in power. So it must be something terrible that makes him want to leave. Notice also uh, where the town could see him. Very strange because it looks like uh, from this sentence, it looks like maybe he is supposed to be ashamed of something that if the townspeople see him, they will mock him or mistreat him. Although all he did was escape being killed. So what's really going on here is the point is not that the town could see him. The point is that that the town knows where he is and could contact him. Uh, this play is uh, focused on Oedipus trying to learn the truth, or we might say to see the truth. And by the end of the play, after he discovers the terrible truth about himself, he blinds himself. He he uh, plucks out his eyes. Uh, so the ending is also very connected with vision, with seeing. So throughout the play, you will see words uh, emphasizing the idea of seeing or not seeing. So Jocasta says this slave is far away. Oedipus, then could he get back here to us and quickly? Yes, but for what? Why, why do you want him to? Wife, I'm afraid that I have said too much, and that is why I want to see this man. So this is also very strange. I want to see him because I have said too much. Well, I think both both 
Uh, both lines are probably true. He has said too much. And he does want to see this man, this slave, but we the audience know that he wants to see this slave to continue learning the truth about what happened to Laius. And yet Idipha says, I'm afraid I have said too much. Uh, on the surface, it looks like uh, he wants to keep his investigation details secret. So like he doesn't really want to tell Jocasta everything. He doesn't want to tell uh, the people around him everything. But it could also be that he's talking about his curse. If you remember last week, he cursed even himself if it turns out that he is helping the killer of Laius. So this sentence could be he's regretting saying that curse. And because he is afraid, therefore he needs to know the truth. Uh, it appears that to Oedipus, not knowing, being stuck in the middle between knowing and not knowing. Uh, I should say uh, being stuck in the middle between knowing it's true and knowing it's not true. Uh, he can't bear this situation. He has to know. So uh, if we wanted to expand these two lines, we could say. I. I want to know whether I made a mistake by cursing myself, and that is why I want to see this man and ask him the truth. Jocasta, but then uh, then he will come. But I think that I too deserve to learn why you're upset, my lord. Uh, and it says. Uh, he starts explaining the situation to her. So the question is, do you think he should have stopped asking questions somewhere on this page? On the one hand, he's an intelligent person, so he knows that if it turns out he is the killer of Laius, then nothing good will happen to him. It will all be bad. He, uh, he cursed whoever helped Laius to be exiled and receive no help. He is already a foreigner from Thebes. He has voluntarily left his family. And so if he is, if he does exile himself, he will have nobody. It would be uh, the worst situation to continue living in. So yeah, from that perspective, if I were Oedipus, I would stop asking questions. On the other hand, he is currently the ruler. He has promised to help Thebes end the plague. Uh, and his investigation is still focused on what happened to Laius and who killed him. If it turns out to be himself and he exiles himself, he personally would suffer, but the city would be saved. So would or should he stop asking simply because the criminal could be himself? As a good king who cares about his people, he should probably keep asking until he finally learns the truth. That's what I think. And that's why I will never be king. Among other reasons, of course. OK, do you have thoughts about this question? OK, question two. Same question, different page. Uh, 33. So um, on page 32, he's still asking Jocasta uh, about exactly what happened to Laius. It if it says, you said he, the slave, claimed that robbers, plural, more than one, killed Laius. If he still says the same in terms of numbers, 
I did not kill him since there is no way that one man can be equal to a group. But if he cites a single traveler. Uh, to cite means uh, to say this other person has, has information. So it could mean to quote or to depend on someone else's evidence. But if he cites a single traveler, this action then is tipping toward me. So Jocasta said that the slave said it was more than one person. But if they call the slave over and ask him directly, and the guy says it was a single person, that would be bad for Oedipus. Jocasta, yes, that is definitely what he said, and there's no way that he can take it back. The city heard all this, not only me, and even if he switched his former story at all, so his older story, at all, my lord, he couldn't ever prove Lias's murder happened as it should have. Uh, so what does that mean? Happen as it should have happened. She goes on to explain. Apollo's oracle said he'd be killed by his and my own son. But that poor boy died long before. He never murdered Lias. So after this, I'd never ever spare a single glance for any oracles. Uh, so again, we have uh, an image related to sight and seeing, a glance, ipie. I'd never spare a glance, which means I wouldn't spend any time or energy on. <clears throat> so because the oracle, according to this evidence, is wrong. Uh, if more than one person killed Laius, it couldn't be Oedipus. And even if it were one person who killed Laius, uh, Laius' son, according to Jocasta, had died long before. So even if it were Oedipus who killed Laius, uh, the prophecy would be false. That's what she thinks. Uh, so. In effect, she here she's telling him, don't worry about the prophecy. Uh, you don't have to investigate that, right? As long as you keep tracking uh, the people who have killed Laius. Um, so at this point, do you think that Oedipus should have stopped asking about himself? Well, he, he does. Well, he doesn't. He says good thinking, but then he says, but in any case, send someone to get the workmen. So in any case means uh, regardless of like what the situation is. So yes, even if we shouldn't trust the Oracle, let's get the slave over here and ask him just in case. So on the one hand, he agrees. On the other hand, he, he continues anyway. So should he have stopped asking about himself here? Uh, yeah, at this point, there's no reason to keep asking about himself, right? He only has to ask about the people who killed Laius. And yet Oedipus is the kind of guy who, as we just talked about for the previous question, even if the result is bad for himself, he still needs to understand the truth. So now in front of him, he is presented with two mysteries. One who killed Laius, two who is he, Oedipus himself. Uh, why is there this prophecy on him that he will kill his father and sleep with his mother? Um, so being the kind of person that he is, I don't think he is able to stop asking about his own life. He probably should, 
stop, but I don't think he's able to. Do you have questions about this one? OK, let's move on to question three, the third choral song. Here. This is page 33, right? Yes, here. Uh, so he asked Jocasta to get the slaves. Jocasta says, I'll hurry up and do it. Let's go in. Let's go inside. I won't do anything that you won't like. Exeunt, which means they leave together. Everyone on stage leaves. Uh, Jocasta and Oedipus into the palace. Uh, into the palace is the, if you remember the ancient Greek stage, this is the middle door in the skinny. Uh, this word exeunt is only used in classical theater. It's from Latin and it means they leave. So they means that it's usually just refers to the main characters. So at this moment on stage, are the chorus, Jocasta and Oedipus, uh, but the chorus stays. So these two leave into the palace. On stage is the chorus only, and we have the third choral song. Let's take a look. May fate be with me, so be on my side. All my words, all my deeds, so actions, are holy and reverent, uh, like uh, religious. Good actions are governed by laws whose feet step high, who are born in the heavens above. So that's what this means, whose feet step high. They're born in the heavens. Laws, laws born in the heavens are laws given by the gods. And Olympus alone is their father, right? The gods alone are the father, or I guess the author of these laws. No mortal nature poured forth or mothered them. Uh, I know, hang on, he's talking about, they're talking about actions. Only Olympus is the father of good actions. So if you do something good, it is because you are obeying the gods. No mortal nature, so no humans uh, poured forth or mothered these good actions. Uh, so you, for English vocabulary, father as a verb means to create. Mother as a verb means to raise, cultivate. Oblivion never will lull them to sleep. So even if nobody knows about good actions, they will continue, they will endure. To lull someone means to make them complacent and e or even sleepy. Great is the God in these places. He does not grow old. Uh, so like in the places of good actions and and uh, like reverent and holy laws, these places uh, have a great God. And this God does not grow old. And you might be thinking, of course, gods are immortal. Of course, they don't grow old. But here the chorus, I think, is talking about the worship of the God. Over time, some gods are forgotten, some gods are added. But here the chorus is saying, in this place of good action and good laws, gods are never forgotten. Arrogance fathers sovereignty. In Chinese, if we if we directly translate this, it means uh, What does this mean? The footnote says this famous line is much debated by scholars. In other words, nobody knows what it means. Uh, 
but on the level of literature, even if we don't think about the cause and effect relationship between these two, there is some kind of a connection, right? Arrogance and sovereignty. Sovereignty here probably is talking about the power of Oedipus as king. So there's some connection here between Oedipus's power and his arrogance. We know he's arrogant because he keeps on asking questions uh, when even when people tell him to stop. He uh, immediately blames Tiresias when Tiresias tries to, to tell him the truth. Uh, first of all, when Tiresias tries not to tell him the truth, and then when Tiresias tells him the truth, both times Oedipus blames him. And also in a skip in a section that we haven't looked at today, uh, when Creon comes back, Oedipus blames Creon of trying to take power through Tiresias. Uh, all behavior is very arrogant. And here the course seems to be saying that this arrogance is what gives Oedipus power as king. Very interesting idea. Let's continue. Arrogance. If filled too full of too much against what's right and good, attains the highest cornices and then topples down headlong to necessity where it can find no footing. So if arrogance is too full of itself, if you're too arrogant and you don't care about what's right and what's good, then from the highest point, a cornice is the uh, sharp part of a roof of a building. So from the highest cornices, uh, the unrightfully arrogant person will topple down headlong. So we'll fall head first to necessity. Where arrogance can find no footing. There's nowhere for arrogance to stand in a necessary situation. Uh, and so here the chorus is connecting necessity to what is right and good. You must do what is right and what is good. And if you don't, you cannot afford to be arrogant. It will hurt you. So on the one hand, it's saying that Oedipus's arrogance gives him power. On the other hand, it's saying if Oedipus is too arrogant, he will fall. But I pray to the God not to end the wrestling that's good for the city. Wrestle, swaijo. Uh, but here it means struggle, conflict. And it's talking about uh, Oedipus's conflicts with Tiresias, with Creon, and now with, uh, it looks like with Jocasta. Like they're not actually like accusing each other, but there's not complete agreement. She keeps telling him like, you, why do you want to ask? Why do you want to know? So the chorus says that this kind of disagreement is good for the city. Uh, I guess this is some kind of democratic idea. Remember, this play was written by Sophocles, who is from Athens, and it was performed in Athens, and Athens was a democracy. So, um, this might be reflecting those kinds of ideas, even if when you do only have one king, it is good for the country and good for the city if your leaders are forced to discuss things. And then the chorus adds, I'll never stop having a God as my savior. So anyone who truly uh, helps the city and its people is following the orders of a God. But if someone is using their hands or their words to step higher than others and fearless of justice shows no due respect to the seats of the gods. Due here means what you owe someone, the, the deserved respect. Uh, to the seats of the gods, where the gods are seated, where they live. 
So not just one God, but all of them. If someone does this, may evil fate take them to pay back the curse of their pride if they profit from ill gotten gains. So if they have some kind of benefit from doing things that are wrong. Ill gotten, they have been gotten through some bad way. Ill means bad, not sick. And gain here is a noun, what they have gained. Uh, so curse them if, if they are not religious and they're too prideful. And if they do not hold back from unspeakable words. Some things you can't say, right? You can't curse the gods. That's unspeakable. If they stupidly touch the untouchable things. Uh, if they do these things, curse them. What man in the midst of such actions, so in the middle of such actions, could ever ward off the weapons of gods from his soul? To ward off means keep away. So it, when a man does these unreligious evil things, how could he protect himself from the gods? He can't. If behavior like this becomes honored, then why should I dance in the chorus? <laughs> this is kind of funny. In the story, of course, there is no chorus, right? The chorus is part of the performance. In the story, these are citizens. Uh, so here, this line seems to be, we call this metafictional, it's uh, literature that points to itself. Usually we say that there's the level of the story and the level of uh, telling the story. So we're reading about the story of Oedipus, uh, but I'm talking to you about how this story is told and the different meanings. Here, this line seems to be talking about the second one, right? He's saying, uh, why sh if, if our leader, is not religious if he does something wrong. Why should I help to tell his story? Kind of interesting. Uh, so if uh, my leader is evil, no longer will I go to honor the navel of Earth. Last week we mentioned this is Apollo's oracle. Uh, the untouchable. You're not supposed to touch the oracle nor to the temple at Abai, nor to Olympia. These are all places uh, connected to Apollo. If these things are not tangible truths, tangible means concrete, something you can touch, something you can confirm. Fitted fast for all mortals. Uh, fast here means secure. Uh, in English, we still use this sometimes. Uh, sometimes you'll hear or say he uh, see someone say. Hold fast, which means hold tight. Or instead of close friends, you might uh, see someone say fast friends. A fast friend is not a friend you make quickly. A fast friend is a friend for life, a secure friend. Uh, fit, it just means fit. So if it is not true that leaders must obey the gods and that arrogant leaders who don't obey the gods will fall, uh, then I will no longer worship Apollo. Do not forget this Zeus master of all. May your power eternal remember it always. Indeed, now the oracles told about Laius are wiped and destroyed. So according to Jocasta, Apollo's oracle was wrong. Laius was not killed by his own son. So the, the oracles, oracle could refer to the person. It could also refer to the prophecy. And because this is plural, it's referring to the prophecy, or to the to the prophecy. Yeah. 
the more than one prophecy that has been told about Laius. On the one hand, um, the prophecies say that Laius will be killed by his son. Uh, and I guess he went to confirm or something, not sure. But anyways, because they are wrong, they are wiped out and destroyed. And Apollo is nowhere shown bright in his glory. Religion is ruined. And that's the end of the third choral song. So what is it talking about? It's talking about religion. And it's connected to um, the idea of good leadership and the status of Apollo's prophecy. So the idea of good leadership is saying a good leadership uh, can be arrogant, right? But it must obey religion. It must be good to the gods. OK, and then it says that. Uh, if this is not true, then I will no longer worship Apollo. And then it says. Apollo's. Um, prophecy has been proven false, so uh, religion is ruined. So if we put these three ideas together. A good leader. Has to be. Religious. Uh, if that's not true, we won't obey religion. Religion will no longer be uh, effective. And finally, because Apollo's prophecies are false, therefore religion is ruined. It seems to be saying. That because Apollo's prophecy is not true. Therefore. Uh, religion is not as trustworthy as before. And so because there is no religion to follow, leaders have no guarantee of staying on top and in charge, even if they do all the right things. So the deconstruction of prophecy, the, the I guess, critical examination of prophecy, has led to the collapse of religion, which will lead to a more changeable political situation, uh, which apparently is a bad thing. If your leaders keep on changing, it's not good for the stability of a society. So this is a very pessimistic song. Um, in yesterday's choral songs, the chorus was reacting to the situation, praying to the gods. But here, the chorus is basically saying things are going to get worse. Because of the discussion that this proves the prophecy, the religious and political situation is going to get worse. Um, this song is also quite interesting because remember, this play was written soon after Athens suffered a, a plague in real life. During that plague, uh, as you might imagine, citizens tried everything to stay healthy, including praying to various gods, just like the citizens of Thebes are doing. Uh, and apparently, it, as you might expect also, it didn't work. The religious, the irreligious, people who pray, people who don't pray, it doesn't have anything to do with who dies from the plague. So during the plague, there was something like a social collapse and a religious collapse, just like the chorus is talking about here. When people realized that being uh, pious, pious and uh, religious did not really help, they stopped believing in religion. And so when the rulers rule from the legitimacy of religion, the people also started losing faith in their political rulers as well. So this is not just an analysis. It is also a reflection of history. Uh, so what is the purpose of prevent, uh, presenting something so pessimistic and cynical? Uh, it could be a warning 
to Oedipus. Uh, you has, no matter what happens, no matter how deep you investigate, you have to try to keep religion uh, intact and try to keep social stability. It could also be foreshadowing Zai my Fubi for the audience who knows that by the end of the play, Oedipus's government will collapse and uh, he will be shunned by all of society. Uh, and the idea that it could be foreshadowing finds support in the fact that uh, the chorus points to itself as a chorus. So it is aware that it is part of telling the story. Therefore, it is aware that there is an audience um, paying attention to this story. So they could um, actively be foreshadowing for that audience. Anyway, that's what I think. Do you have questions about three? OK, let's um, look at four. Same question after Jocasta leaves on 41. Uh, OK, so what's going on here? On the previous page, uh, they had previously summoned that slave to ask about the death of Laius. Uh, they got the information. The slave left. But after continuing to ask questions, Oedipus is starting to ask about his uh, own childhood or like what happened to Jocasta's baby that she says died long before. And apparently she gave the baby to a slave and asked the slave to let the baby die in the mountains. Uh, and it's the same slave. So now he's Oedipus is saying, do you, wife, do you know the man whom recently we summoned here? So the guy we asked about Elias, do you know him? Is he the one he means? Is he the person who knows about your baby? Jocasta, why mention him? Just turn away. Forget that all these empty words were ever spoken. Empty because she wants to convince him not to believe them. Oedipus, there's no way I could get such evidence as this and not reveal my origins. So he is committed to finding out the truth about himself. Jocasta, know by the gods, if you value your life, don't make this search. My sickness is enough. Uh, sickness, I guess, is talking about her own mental situation. She's probably not sick from the plague, otherwise they would not be talking to each other and she probably would be dead. Uh, so it's probably a mental anxiety. At this point, we can probably tell Jocasta knows what happened. Uh, but Oedipus needs evidence, right? He needs evidence. He can't just hear it from people. He needs to have first hand witnesses. Uh, so she says, don't make the search. And Oedipus says, don't worry. If I am on mother's side, third generation slave, you're still a queen. Uh, this is interesting. Oedipus apparently is not, is only worried that he is not from a good family. Like, uh, if he was an abandoned baby, people abandon babies usually like because they can't take care of them. Uh, and usually if you can't take care of a baby, it's because you don't have enough money. So like or like you're a slave or something. So he says, uh, don't worry, even if I'm the lowest of the slaves, I'm still a king and you're still a queen. He has not yet thought that maybe he would be the son of Laius. That possibility has not occurred to him yet. Uh, but the idea here is that Oedipus is a king 
not because he's from he's a royal child, uh, but because of his achievements, right? The Thebans made him king after he answered the Sphinx's riddle. So because his king uh, legitimacy does not depend on his family, so even if he is a third generation slave, he would still continue to be king. And therefore, Jocasta would still continue to be queen, and therefore Oedipus says, don't worry. Of course, that's not what Jocasta is worried about. Listen to me, I beg you, don't do this. No, I won't listen. I must learn the truth. I'm saying this with your own good in mind. Then this own good has long been harming me. So this response is also quite interesting. He's saying the way that you want to do good for me is by not letting me know. And this ignorance, this lack of knowledge is harming me. It's hurting me. Uh, he So he doesn't just want to know the truth. He feels the need to learn the truth. Not learn, knowing the truth is actually hurting him. You're cursed, poor man. You don't know who you are. So this is this line is very interesting. It has two different meanings. You're cursed, first of all, like you can't stop yourself from asking for the truth. That's a kind of curse. Secondly, uh, she apparently realizes that he did kill Laius, so he has cursed himself. But third, of course, she also seems to realize that he is her son. And so by killing his father and sleeping with his mother, he's also cursed himself. So it's a, there are three different meanings to this part. The second part is also uh, a pun. The first meaning is you don't know who you are, which means you literally don't know who you are. You don't know your origins. The second meaning is you are not like yourself. This the way that you keep on asking and you need to know. It, you, it's like you have become another person. You don't know who you are anymore. Uh, and if it's just ignores her, he says, won't someone go and bring that herdsman here? Let her enjoy her wealthy family. Uh, so he still thinks that Jocasta is worried about his family background being like too low or too poor. So he says, let her enjoy her wealthy family. I want to know my family, no matter how poor or how low. Oh, you poor man, that's all I have to say, and it's the last thing that I'll ever say. And she leaves. And she doesn't appear for the rest of the play. So the question is, at this moment, do you think Oedipus should have stopped asking when his own wife begged him to stop for his own good and even protested by leaving the stage? Do you think he should have stopped? Let's take a short break and we'll talk about the answer when we come back. So when Jocasta begs Oedipus to stop asking questions, tells him you're cursed, and then says she'll never say anything again. Last thing I'll ever say. And then leaves. All because it is for his own good to stop asking questions about his origins. Do you think he should have stopped? Well, the thing is, he's not asking about Laius's death anymore, right? He's asking about his own background. So yeah, I think he should have stopped. When his wife is so adamant that it's not good for him to continue, I would try to live with the 
Ignorance. I would try to live with the not knowing. Uh, but of course, Oedipus continues. The chorus is, why on earth Oedipus has your wife rushed away in desperate grief? I am afraid some trouble will be breaking from her silence. And then Oedipus says, then let it break. So he, no matter what bad thing happens, he will keep on asking. He will keep on investigating. Question uh, five, the fourth choral song. Uh, actually, so let's 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 uh, connect these two. Let's keep going. Uh, then let it break. Let her do as she pleases. So whatever she wants. That's what as you please means, whatever you want. But as for me, I want to see the source of my own birth, however small and lowly. She's full of pride. As women are. And maybe she is ashamed of my bad family. Uh, so the footnote uh, gives an interesting information about this phrase, bad family. Uh, it, it literally means bad birth. And so even though he is born of the family of Laius, which is a royal family, not a bad family, um, it is a bad birth because he, uh, the prophecy says that he will kill his father, sleep with his mother. But I account myself the son of fate. I, I think of myself, I consider myself to be the son of fate. Who gives good things. OK, that's not exactly entirely true. Fate is neutral. There is good fate and bad fate. But here he's focused only on the good part, the good possibilities. We could say that this is part of his arrogance. And I'll not be ashamed. Uh, well, we could also say that it's it's uh, depending on his life story so far. Um, Oedipus, before he left his own city, was well loved. Uh, then he defeated the Sphinx, became ruler of Thebes, and that seems to all be good. So judging from what has happened in his life so far, I guess he could think that fate only gives him good things. It's not right, it's not correct, but based on the information about his own life, uh, it, it's not unreasonable either. She is my mother. Uh, talking about fate, fate is my mother. And my kindred, my family, are the months that made me small and made me big. Uh, this seems to be talking about the moon. Fate is my mother and the moon is my family. So like with the waxing and waning of the moon, uh, what is that in Chinese? Uh, is a symbol of the passing of time. So it's connected with the idea of fate. If your fate is revealed over time. Uh, so whether it makes him small, lowly, unworthy, cursed, uh, in a disadvantageous position, or it makes him big, king, in power, loved, in control, happy. Uh, no matter which one, he is still the son of fate. So born, born like this, so means in this way like this, so born, I'd never turn to someone else, the kind who wouldn't learn my origins. So because I am born this way, I am this kind of person. 
And so because I am this kind of person, I must learn my origins. Uh, and then we have the fourth choral song. If I am a prophet with judgment and knowledge, I swear by Olympus that you, Mount Cithaeron, this is the mountain where uh, the baby Oedipus was left to die. He doesn't know, of course. He, he still thinks of this baby as Jocasta's child. He doesn't know that it's himself. Uh, so if I am a prophet, I swear that you, Mount Cithaeron, at moonlight tomorrow, will be raised up in glory as ancestor, mother, and nursemaid of Oedipus. Oh, sorry, I had that flipped. So Oedipus knows that he was found on Mount Cithaeron. He doesn't know that this is where Jocasta abandoned her baby. Uh, so the chorus here is praising Mount Cithaeron as ancestor, mother, and nursemaid, Naima, of Oedipus. And we will be dancing for you in our chorus because you bring blessings for rulers of ours. Hallelujah, Apollo. May this be your will. Uh, your will, your intention. May this be your will. But who was your mother, child? Which of the long lived nymphs, Shen Yu? Uh, or Jingling, your Jingling, on the mountain had met with your father, Pan. Uh, Yang Nan, if you've seen the movie Pan's Labyrinth, Yang Nan de Mi Gong. Uh, he is a god of the flute, Cang Di. Or I guess not, not Cang Di, it's, it's his own kind of flute, uh, Pan flute. God of flute music and the god of trickery and like making jokes. So the chorus is describing Oedipus as maybe the son of Pan and a nymph. So like a, a god-like or half god-like man. Or who slept with Apollo, with Loxias? Who is Loxias? Is a cult title of Apollo. So it's one of Apollo's names. Uh, so here they are calling Apollo. Oedipus's father. All of the countryside pastures are dear to him. Or was it Hermes, the Lord of Selene? Selene is a place where Hermes is worshipped. Or Bacchus, otherwise known as Dionysus, the god of wine and revelry, uh, Kuang Wu. The god who inhabits the mountaintops uh, who took you as foundling from one of the flashing eyed nymphs whom he often is playing with. A foundling is a child who is found in the wild. Uh, so here the chorus is asking, are you, were you found by Bacchus? Or maybe found by Hermes? Hermes is the messenger god. Uh, and the God of Travelers. And that's the end of the choral song. So this short choral song does two things. One, it praises the place where Oedipus was found. Then it speculates about who Oedipus's parents are. And all of these speculations, they're not real speculations. They probably don't think that Oedipus was the son of a God or something. It's symbolic, right? Uh, such a great man, you must have had a great father. Or at least you must have been found by uh, someone great, uh, one of these gods maybe. Uh, but notice the gods that they choose. Apollo, the person who says, uh, the god who says that Oedipus will kill his father, sleep with his mother, and up to now apparently has been proven wrong. Or it could be Hermes, the god of uh, the messenger god or the god of travelers. And Oedipus is a traveler. He came from Corinth where he was raised. 
or Bacchus, the god of wine and revelry and crazy parties. Uh, not a very king-like god to be raised by. Uh, Dionysus and Bacchus and wine, of course, is connected with the disruption of social order. Uh, usually when Bacchus comes to town, things get crazy, people get drunk, women are become loose and wild and dance naked in the streets. Uh, so invoking Bacchus is not a good sign for the king. So it's saying like the, the root of social disorder, the source of social disorder is the king himself, which is true in this case. So it's also a kind of foreshadowing. Um, so what is this choral song doing? First, it's confirming that uh, they are still on Oedipus's side, right? They uh, raise up the place where he was found as a great place uh, that brings blessings. But it also keeps uh, in play that fundamental anxiety and um, unsure attitude about who Oedipus's real father actually is. Uh, and yet it, it talks about it in a good way, right? Like a, a god um, was his father or a god discovered Oedipus. Um, so it's siding with Oedipus while keeping the question alive. And it's important that Oedipus has support at this point because Jocasta, one of the few people who uh, started out on his side, has left him. So now the only person who's still on Oedipus' side is the chorus. Uh, and that's the end of this week's reading. Okay, so do you have questions about five? Okay, uh, then let's, uh, you know, for before next week, please finish the play. So let's go back to the beginning of this week's selection and we'll talk about it in more detail. Right, so at the beginning of this week's selection, uh, at the uh, at the end of last week, I should say, uh, Oedipus has been arguing with Tiresias. Uh, they curse each other and both leave, and then we have a choral song. Um, okay, not important. I'll deal with that later. At the beginning of this week, Creon arrives. Creon is Jocasta's brother. I've come here, men of Thebes, because I learned that Oedipus, our leader, has accused me of dreadful things, and I won't stand for it. So Oedipus has accused Creon of trying to take power by using Tiresias to blame Oedipus for the plague. Dreadful means terrible. If in the present crisis, so in the current crisis, he imagines that he has suffered any kind of harm from me in word or deed or action, then I do not wish for a long life if I must bear this charge. So he's saying like I'd rather die than be blamed for something I did not do. To bear means to carry, to have on, on himself. A charge here means an accusation. Indeed, this accusation brings for me no simple punishment, but total ruin if I am called a criminal in Thebes. Uh, ruin, of course, just means like destruction, everything is over. 
if I am called a criminal in Thebes and called a criminal by you as well and by my family and friends. Why would it bring total ruin? Because Creon is not an average citizen. He is the brother of the queen. Uh, and as the play will tell us a bit later, he has an agreement with Oedipus and Jocasta. Even though Oedipus is the only king, they agree that all three of them will have the same amount of power. So if someone as powerful as Creon uh, did betray the country by trying to take down Oedipus, simple punishment would not be enough. He would either be exiled or killed. So Creon comes, the chorus says, come now. Uh, come now in, in, in Chinese means hala hala. The insult happened, yes, but it was maybe forced out by anger, not by conscious thought. Uh, and it's true, it if it was angry. Conscious means aware, your ishida. But was it said in public that the prophet was swayed by my advice to tell those lies? Sway means influence. So Yes, that was said, but I don't know the motive. The word motive is only used when talking about crime or actions. Uh, for all other uses, uh, we use the noun motivation. Uh, yeah, motive is only used for crime. So for all other actions, we use motivation. Uh, so yes, he did say this in public. And was he thinking straight and looking straight and making this accusation against me? And here the chorus chickens out. I do not know because I do not see what those in power over me are doing. So the chorus gives the polite answer. I don't know what people in power are doing. I don't understand. I don't try to understand people in power. I only obey. I only follow. But he himself is coming outside now. OK, remember last week I said that the original play does not have stage directions. Right, so like this was added by the translator. But this line looks like a stage direction, right? It's forcing the production to move the actors in a certain way. No choice. Oedipus must come out after this line. Uh, so some scholars have thought that this is an interpolation, which means that it was added later by someone else throughout the many centuries of the Western classical tradition when this play was being passed down from the 5th century BCE to today, somebody in the middle maybe added this line. Enter Oedipus from the palace, so he exits from the middle opening of the skenny. You, how did you get here? Have you become so brazen, uh, that you dare to show your face and come to my house when you are clearly the murderer of that man and the proven flagrant thief? Flagrant means you, you uh, do something bad, not uh, because you don't care about how people see you, but because you want people to see you. You do something bad because you want people to see you. A flagrant thief who tried to steal my power. Come on then, talk by gods. Uh, so this is like swearing, like God damn you, that kind of idea. Aha. Yeah, uh, Teams has censored uh, my swearing. Uh, so in Chinese, something like Sangtian Zuzhou. So come on then, talk by gods. Did you perceive some foolishness or cowardice in me? Did you see where I was foolish 
or where I was scared. Cowardice, Dan Shaw. So you decided you would do this. Uh, so here he's accusing Oedipus of uh, like uh, taking advantage of Creon or trying to take advantage of Creon. Or did you think that I wouldn't recognize that it was you who made this treacherous plot? Treacherous is a Taylor Swift song. It's also a word that means dangerous, but the root of this word treachery. It, uh, or even the noun root treason. Is to betray your country. So here he's using the original meaning of this word treacherous. A plot against uh, his country, including Creon, who has power. Sneaking against me. No, so doing this in secret. Or did you think that when I found out you thought that I would fail in self-defense? This plan of yours is stupid, isn't it? Uh, this plan of yours, this actually does not mean exactly the same thing as your plan. This plan of yours is like mocking the plan. That's how shall need a jihua. Something like that. To hunt for power with no wealth or friends. And it's true. Uh, Oedipus himself has no money. His money comes from his wife, Jocasta. And because he's a traveler from out of the city, he has no real friends. To get it, you need influence and money. Sorry, I've been I've been doing this wrong. This is Oedipus talking. So Oedipus is accusing Creon of trying to steal power, right? Uh, so treachery against Oedipus is treachery against the king. It's treason. Um, so like Creon is trying to steal Oedipus's power. Did you think that I, Oedipus, was foolish or was afraid? Did you think that I, Oedipus, wouldn't know it was you? Or did you think that I, Oedipus, would fail in self-defense? This plan of yours is stupid. You have no wealth or friends. I don't think that's true. I think he does have wealth and friends. Not sure what Oedipus is talking about. Uh, I guess what he's saying is if Creon had wealth or friends, he wouldn't use such a stupid plan to try to take power. He would have more people working for him. Uh, and if it says to get power, you need influence and money. So money is wealth, influence is friends. Creon. Trade in your words for listening as an equal. So instead of talking, listen. Trade in, right? Exchange. Trade A for B uh, as an equal. You need to understand before you judge. Which is true, I think. Oedipus, I'm bad at listening to your clever words because I found you mean and cruel toward me. Like Oedipus is really angry right now, right? Creon, just hear me out on this one thing for once. So like, let me explain. Hear me out. Let me explain. Just this one thing. Don't tell me you're not evil. Creon, if you think mindless, willful stubbornness is something clever, you're not thinking straight. So he's calling Oedipus uh, mindless with a willful stubbornness. His stubbornness is mindless and willful. So mindless means like not using your head. You're not thinking clearly. Willful means. Uh, um, uh, what is this in Chinese? I just thought of it. Wang Wei. Yi Wang Wei. Like to do whatever you want. Your whatever your will uh, wants to do, you do. So this kind of stubbornness. 固执, 
If you think this is clever, you're not thinking straight. If you think you can harm a family member and have no punishment, you must be crazy. Yes, I agree. What you said then is fair. So from this line, we can tell that there is only one person who's angry on stage, angry to the point of irrationality, and that is Oedipus. Creon, when he hears something that is correct, he can still say, yeah, you're right, I agree. But teach me, what's this harm you say you suffered? So if you say that I have hurt you, OK, how did I hurt you? Did you or did you not persuade me, Creon, that it was necessary for me to send someone to fetch that high and mighty prophet? Uh, fetch is a dialy to bring here. Uh, this sentence is a sentence of accusation. Did you or did you not? Yes, and I still believe that plan was good. So how much time has passed by now since Laius uh, and Creon here interrupts Oedipus? Did what exactly? I don't understand. S vanished, subdued by hands that had dealt him death. So this is an interesting way to put this. Uh, and the footnote tells us that the word for uh, here used is a word that literally means handing and metaphorically means overpowering. So the translator has tried to preserve the image of hands. Um, so the idea here is that Laius, uh, the only reason we think that Laius has died is because one of his slaves came back and told us. Nobody else really saw this happen. So really truthfully, what happened to Elias is he vanished. He was subdued uh, by hands that dealt him death. So like he was killed. Uh, so here's a good question. Why does the play interrupt Oedipus here with a line from Creon? It could easily have continued the previous line, right? He, it could have connected these two lines. But by having Creon say something in the middle, it makes Oedipus pause. And so when he continues to talk and he mentions what happened to Laius, it adds more power to this second line. It's kind of like uh, when you're telling a scary story and you want to keep the conclusion to the end, and you pause before the last line of your story. It gives it more power. Uh, Creon, a long and ancient measurement of time. He's talking about death. Death is a long and ancient measurement of time. Yes, it is the longest time. There's no coming back from it. So was this seer? I'm oh, sorry, no, he's answering. The question, how much time has passed? Uh, and Creon says, it's been a long time since Laius died. Oedipus, so was this seer? A seer is a prophet. Shinzi. Again, the idea of seeing. Was he not practicing back then? To practice means to do your job. Uh, so to practice for a doctor means to go see patients. For your lawyer means to go see clients and go to court. For a prophet means to give oracles and prophecies. So was Tiresias not working back then? Yes, he was just as wise and just as honored as now. Then at the time, did he name me at all? So this is a good question, right? If Tiresias was already working as a prophet, back when Laius was killed, did he mention me, Oedipus? Uh, Creon, no, at least not when I was standing near him. So he did not hear Tiresias accuse Oedipus. So like Oedipus's meaning is therefore, why is he suddenly accusing me now? 
if he did not accuse me back then. Isn't this a conspiracy? Ying Mo. It if this continues, did you not have a search to catch the killer? Of course we did. Oh, we heard not a thing, so no results. Why did this wise man not speak up back then? I don't know. When I don't know, I stay silent. Also very interesting. Because this second part of his answer is telling Oedipus, if you don't know, if you're only speculating and guessing, if you don't know, you shouldn't talk. Uh, but Oedipus says, you do know this. He says, this is Zhuang Si. And you'd be smart to speak. Of what? If I do know, I won't deny it. So what do I know? If it says that if he hadn't been in league with you, into and to be in league with someone. A league is a large group of people. Uh, the original meaning of this word is a group of people gathered together for one goal, one kind of purpose. Uh, but here it just means like working with in conspiracy with you. If he hadn't been in league with you, he never would have said that I killed Lias. So we'll notice at this point that Oedipus's logic is kind of off. It's true, uh, it's kind of weird that Tiresias did not mention Oedipus back then, but it does not necessarily follow that mentioning Oedipus now is a conspiracy working with Creon. That's jumping too far. Um, Creon's response, you know if he says that. Uh, so if he said it, you would know. In other words, he did not say it. He did not say that Oedipus killed Laius. Well, it's true, Tiresias didn't say those words, but he did say that Oedipus was the source of the plague. Uh, what's going on here is that the source of the plague is not uh, the person who killed Laius. It is the person who killed his father and married his mother. It just so happens that the father of this person is named Laius. So it's like two definitions of the same person. Uh, so when Tiresias is saying, you, Oedipus, are the source of the curse, when Apollo says uh, the source of the curse is someone who has killed his father, uh, is the person who has killed Laius, they both are talking about the same thing, uh, the same person. So you see that in at least in this kind of Greek prophecy, the point is not what you do. The point is what person you are. Uh, to explain this in probably in a more straightforward way, Oedipus killed Laius. And he also killed his father and slept with his mother. Tyrese, uh, Apollo says that the source of the plague is the person who killed his father, uh, who killed Laius. But Tiresias apparently is seeing in the future that Oedipus will discover he has killed his father and married his mother. So these are two different definitions. And only at the end of the play does Oedipus realize that both of those definitions are talking about himself. Uh, so the first definition is the person who killed Laius. The second definition is the person who killed his own father and slept with his own mother. Uh, so Tiresias did not say, technically did not say that Oedipus killed Laius. Uh, so Creon points this out. He didn't really say that. I think it right to learn from you just as you learned from me. So what is this talking about? Ah, so he's saying, uh, OK, you're asking me these questions. I also want to ask you questions. 
It is go on then, but I won't be found a killer. All right then, are you married to my sister? There's no denial possible for that. Well, not now at least. The footnote tells us that his answer uh, is half joking. Uh, but of course, by the end of the play, there's nothing funny about this situation. Do you rule thieves on equal terms with her? Yes, I take care of anything she wants. So the idea here is that uh, Oedipus and Jocasta have equal power, but because Jocasta is a woman, she cannot have public power. Therefore, she has to depend on Oedipus, and that's why he says, I take care of everything, anything she wants. She rules Thebes through him. And am I third, the equal to you two? Oedipus says, that's why you're shown up as an evil friend. So that's why you have been revealed as an evil friend. A friend could also mean family member. It's the same word in Greek. OK, so Creon has the information he wants. Now he's going to put it all together. This is very exciting. Uh, so it is again accuses Creon. Creon says, I'm not. Take time to think as I have done. Firstly, consider this. Would anyone prefer to rule accompanied by fear than to sleep carefree with no cares, no worries? And have the exact same power. I, for my part, have no innate desire, nei de yuwang, to be a leader rather than to lead. So the important thing to Creon is to have the leader's power to lead, to actually uh, lead and have the power. And it's not as important for him to be a leader or to be seen as the leader. And anybody sane who is not crazy would feel the same. As things are now, I get it all from you and never have to fear. But if I were myself the ruler, I would have to do many things that I didn't want to do. So here Creon is talking about being seen as the leader. But this sentence is also true for any leader. Anybody in power who has a, an important position will have to do things that they don't want to do. And I don't just mean like go to all the different parties and like talk to everybody. I mean that leaders all have to make decisions that they don't like because it may not be the best decision or it may not be a good decision but it is the best possible decision. Uh, if you're the leader, you can't just say, let someone else take care of this. So how could I feel happier in power than having influence at no expense? I'm not yet so misguided as to want anything that's not good and beneficial. Uh, beneficial just means has a benefit, you lead. As things are now, I can greet everyone. Now everyone is glad to see me. Now people who long for you, who want you, who want to see you, can call on me and they get everything like this through me. So why would I lose this to grasp at that? Why would I give up this kind of power simply to try, maybe not to succeed, only to try for your power, more public power? I have no desire for those priorities. Here, priorities means rank, public rank. Nor would I join another in such actions. So I wouldn't want to and I wouldn't work with someone else to do this. Find proof yourself. Go ask the oracle at Delphi if I've told the truth to you. 
And if you catch me plotting with the prophet, to plot as a verb means to engage in a conspiracy. If you catch me plotting with the prophet Tiresias, don't kill me by a single vote, but take a double, yours and mine. Uh, so to kill someone by voting, we talked about this last week in Athens, not in Thebes probably, but in Athens, the law courts were all decided by vote. If someone is guilty or not is divided by majority vote, and after that, if the person is guilty, how should we punish them is also divided, decided by vote. Uh, and the way the sentencing, the sentencing works is the person who brings the case, the accuser or the prosecutor, depending on the case, will propose one sentence, and the accused person, the person who has been uh, determined to be guilty, will propose another uh, sentence, and the jury will vote on which one they will uh, implement. So here he's saying, don't kill me by a single vote. Don't just punish me, try me in court, but take a double vote, yours and mine. So if you think I, if you catch me in conspiracy, don't just put me on trial, put you on trial. Uh, and the idea is uh, catching Creon in conspiracy is impossible. Therefore, Oedipus would be lying or the evidence would be false, and therefore Oedipus should also go to court. Do not accuse me by unclear evidence in isolation. So in isolation has two meanings according to the footnote. It could mean by this unclear evidence alone, or it could mean by yourself with nobody supporting you. It is not right to think bad people good or good ones bad. Uh, so bad people to be good or good people to be bad. I say it's just the same if you reject a good and well-loved friend or your own life, which you love the most of all. So calling a bad person good or a good person bad is the same as rejecting a good and well-loved friend or your own life. Terrible things to do. In time, you'll know for certain. Only time reveals an honest man. Although you can recognize someone bad in just one day. So in this long speech, Creon is explaining why Oedipus is wrong and then trying to persuade Oedipus to listen to reason uh, because to blame a good man is a great evil. When he has an explanation for why he is good, Oedipus should not keep calling him evil. At this point, the chorus agrees with Creon and they tell Oedipus, a person careful not to fall, my lord, would say he's right. Quick thinkers are not stable. So if you keep jumping from idea to idea very quickly without thinking through those ideas, without completing those ideas and checking them, then you are not acting in a very stable way. And here Oedipus replies to the chorus. A sly conspirator is plotting fast against me. Sly means secret and careful. So I also must be quick in planning counter moves. Counter just means fan. If I sit idle doing nothing, he'll do what he intends, what he wants to do, and I will fail. Creon, what do you want to drive me from the land? If it's no, not at all. I want you dead, not exiled. Wow. So Oedipus is not satisfied with exile. He wants Creon to die. And here the footnote tells us there's something missing from the play because Oedipus' response does not 
or these two lines, traditionally this has been Creon and this has been Oedipus. But uh, the translator believes that uh, it makes more sense to say that Oedipus says this line and Creon says this line. In any case, we're missing material before this line here, and we're missing material after this line here. So we don't really we, we don't have a full context, and so we're not quite sure how to deal with these two middle lines. Um, let's stop here today uh, at this place of disruption where we don't we're not quite sure what's going on. Do you have questions about today's reading? Okay.